my view of myself as a leader was I started to see myself differently. And it came through, you know, sometimes the wrong kind of interactions with people, mm -hmm. you know, that, where I made people very uncomfortable. And when they had the courage to tell me, and I didn't realize it, that I was doing what I was doing, step back and you say, whoa, like, I need to be much more self-aware, right? I need to be much more empathetic. I need to be self-deprecating to some degree to be able to connect differently with different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And that was really when I started to change my style. That was in the Astro Merck days. David, sincere thanks. Honored that you're here in so many ways. I hope you know that. Well, thank um, you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Agenda-wise, blank sheet of paper. We're going to be talking about leadership and, and maybe starting in the Wayback Machine. Do you remember, you're a kid, or maybe it was when you were working at Merck. Do you remember the first time you ever said, that person's a leader, that was leadership? I would say, uh, I'm thinking about my college football experience. I was a sophomore who made the starting offensive line, and there was a lineman next to me. I was a tackle, and he was a guard, and he was a senior, and I was a sophomore. And um, he was surprised that I got the starting job. I beat out a friend of his who was also a senior, and so, at first I thought there was a little bit of resentment, but then I came to realize that he was all about the team and that just because I was a sophomore and less experienced than his friend, we needed to work more closely together to make sure that we could be successful, you know, as an O-line. Bill Hind is his name. His nickname hmm. was Butt. <laughs> <laughs> For but, probably very obvious reasons, yes, yes. <laughs> and Butt was a guy who I really looked up to. And I, I remember uh, sophomore year, our first game of the season was against the University of Delaware, who at the time was rated the number one Division II college football team in the nation. And we were in Gettysburg. and. Um, we uh, played the first half reasonably well. We were down at the half, but not bad. And we went in at halftime. I was exhausted and I laid down on the floor in the locker room next to Butt. And Butt looked over at me and he said, you know, they have a whole nother team that they're gonna put out in the second half. <laughs> so, you're not gonna see any of those guys again. Yeah, like they're we're done. getting all new guys. So they're done. Uh, but he was somebody who I looked up to. I, I really admired him because of the way he acknowledged, you know, where I should fit in and helped me do it. Yeah. Which, which was good and unexpected. Yeah, and so it's the whole idea of you you have, and you're very aware of this, right? You've displaced somebody that he would rather be next to. Yeah. And then he initiated and said, okay. He, he stepped up to it. You're here, right? We're on the same team. By the way, was that the same game you walked out on the field and you were looking down the field at the Delaware game and you were going, yeah, those guys aren't so big. and. Yeah we're, yeah, we're okay here. Yeah, and then the and, line came out. And then the lineman came out. <laughs> it was yeah. like, oh, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that was the, oh. there's a few big guys down there, but but they don't look too big. He said, wait till the line comes <laughs> yeah, out. Wait till the line, we're, we're there like a couple of NFL All-Pro Redskin. Yeah, Redskin players, absolutely. Yeah. Two guys, one of them, I had his cleat marks on my chest and <laughs> grass <laughs> burns on my back, actually. If you had to, um, yeah, there's like 17 million definitions of leadership, right? But how would you define what Butt did there? How, how would you define, is there a definition, you know, that you have become comfortable with or description, you know, of, of, of leadership? Well, you know, it's a bit cliche-ish because of the work that you do, but I think some of that is situational. Like I saw Butt step up to something that he was uncomfortable with, yeah. but did it for the right reason yeah. and, and said, you know, like this is what I should do as opposed to I resent the way this got handled by the coach. And I think I found in my work experience, you're challenged at times to do the same thing, which is step into a situation where not everybody's gonna be comfortable with the, you know, the thought you're bringing to the party or the decision you're going to make that's gonna affect the group. 
so in the leadership context of that, there's a bit of a why as opposed to a how. Mm -hmm. And when you have the why clear in your mind about why you're doing what it is you're about to do, I think it's easier to step up, and even if it makes people uncomfortable, and you say, here's what we're gonna do, but here's why we're gonna do it. You know, let's make sure we got the why worked out before we figure out the, the what or the how. Yeah. And I think Butt did the right thing for the why. He was, for the team, he was a team guy. Yeah, bigger than yeah, it was, you know, I need to do this. I need to help the sophomore out, you know. And we're good friends to this day. Yeah. I mean, 40 plus years later, Bill Hind is still one of my friends. You've obviously done a lot of leadership and, and had that sort of courage and, and managed a number of those moments throughout your career. But you're also, you know, uniquely qualified to talk about um, leadership development from a training standpoint. Are those moments and are those things trainable from your perspective. What is the value of training leaders in organizations, you know, as opposed to just, you know, hiring, trying to find during the hiring process somebody that has those qualities or those characteristics yeah. and then introducing them? You know, I've always been of the persuasion that it's easier to train management skill than it is to train leadership. And I don't say leadership skill, I would just say leadership. You know, if I back up and think about learning to become a manager and what were the skills I needed to be an effective manager, how do I apply them, how do I get better, that wasn't leadership to me. That was really the responsibility you have for the process that you put in place to get work done. So I can sit with you and we can discuss what it is that you're supposed to be doing, what are the resources required, what's the time frame within which you're supposed to deliver it, how frequently do you want to check back with me so we make sure we're on the right path, all around management activity. I think the leadership side of things is much more of a development over time as opposed to a one-week management training course where at the end of the week you can demonstrate certain skills and say, okay, I may not have practiced it much yet, but I understand what I'm supposed to do to get this work done. And I think the leadership part of it for me was much more of a journey. I didn't really consider leadership, um, uh, you know, in, in the way I think about it now, you know, when I first became a manager, I was much more of a, of a, of a you know, a, a task focused person. And I mm -hmm. was managing to get stuff done. I was probably a bit abrasive as a manager at times because I was so focused on an endpoint. And if somebody couldn't get there at the speed with which I thought we should get there, and you know, they you know would be taken aback a little bit. And you know, I think part of me learned in leadership that that's not necessarily a great management style. It might be for some people but you lead other people differently than that too, right? Mm -hmm. So some people that works with, some people that don't, when you recognize that, that's a, that's a leadership skill. Yeah. <laughs> it's a leadership learning. I don't know if it's a skill, but it's, boy, Sam is a racehorse. I need to run him fast and pat him down when I get him back to the barn. You know, Joe is not a racehorse. I need to coax him and get the thing out and swat him a couple of times and, you know, <laughs> show him that I love him and I support him and we got to get that done, right? So I think that's, that's more of a development from a leadership perspective. And, and over time, there are a lot more experiences, I think, that you begin to see yourself differently. I think my view of, of myself as a leader was I started to see myself differently. And it came through, you know, sometimes the wrong kind of interactions with people. Mm -hmm. you know that where i made people very uncomfortable and when they had the courage to tell me and i didn't realize it that i was doing what i was doing step back and you say whoa like i need to be much more self-aware right i need to be much more empathetic i need to be self-deprecating to some degree to be able to connect differently with different kinds of people mm -hmm. and that was really when i started to change my style that was in the Astor Merck days i would okay. say to you you know, I had already managed a bunch of stuff within the Merck organization. I think that task focus was probably very much a Merck kind of cultural trait. And, you know, as we were creating a new organization, we were trying to create a different culture. And that different culture just required a different way of approach to things. Yeah. Well, and you came in on the commercial side, right? As a sales rep, that was your first, yes. your first job. Why did you get promoted? And I'm assuming your first promotion was to DM, or did you take a rotation inside? I took a rotation inside. Okay. 
in that kind of culture that you described that was heavy on task, and, and by the way, you know, Merck wasn't much different than you know anybody else back in that era. Mm -hmm. But how did you get promoted? Why did you get promoted? You know, you, you know, what was the rationale for here's somebody that's been doing this for a while. You know, let's let's move them into this position where they're in charge of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what I, qualified you? <laughs> I, I think the very first thing that gets attention is good performance on the sales line. So, as a sales rep, both as a regular rep for a couple of years and then in hospital territory for a couple of years, I was very successful with introducing new products in the hospitals and antibiotic where we weren't expected to do well, fighting up against Lilly, who was the, at the time, the leader in injectable antibiotics in the world, and we came out with a product, and I was at NYU and Bellevue Hospital in New York, and Lilly had a stronghold there, and, you know, we were able to establish our product there in a couple of months, and, you know, had tremendous sales. And so all of a sudden, I think the region manager saying to the district manager, What's this guy doing at Bellevue? Like, what's going on? <laughs> How come he's more successful than some of our other people? So I think that gets some attention. And then the answer to the question about, well, why is he more successful is something that a manager is better equipped to answer than a rep, right? Like, you're out work and thinking, I'm ambitious. I hope I get a chance to do something else. But as I've always said in every job I ever had, I need to do this job really well. Whether I like it or not is not the question. Mm -hmm. You know, can you be the best at what you're doing even if you're not crazy about the job? I love being in sales, so it was something that was one of my sweet spots, I think. But, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I think it got some attention and they liked the way I was doing things, which was ethical and honest and straightforward. I think I became very, very knowledgeable about the competitive products so that when I was engaging with a, a physician about about an antibiotic they might select for a certain type of patient, I could discuss my competitor's products as well as my own to be able to engage in that conversation. And I think, you know, that kind of thing was probably above and beyond what some other people were doing. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because I needed to do it to be effective in a place like NYU, mm -hmm. in Bellevue, where, you know, the residents are at the top of their learning. This is medical school now, residency, you know, fellowships. You know, these are really, really intelligent people. You've got to be able to engage them at a, you know, at their level. So I think that probably was the first thing that happened. And then I went inside for a year. I was in that rotation program. It was really a management training program. And the guy who was in charge of all of the inside stuff liked me, Dr. Elliot Margolis, and recommended that I become a district manager. And I ended up in Chicago working for Ed Fitzpatrick. Describe your first struggles as a manager. Like where did they come from? I'm assuming you had a few you were promoted or, or sort of made a name for yourself because you were really technically proficient, you know, in comparison to your peers. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the age old way of who are we going to put in this rotation? It's yeah. like, well, at least somebody that's really doing their job well. But when you showed up after, after the rotation and you, you took over your district, um, first formal management position, what were the nature of any, any struggles that you may have, uh, may have encountered. What, what advice, I guess, would you have for high, you know, very technically proficient people that are now going to be managing people for the first time? One of the things about the Merck organization, and you, have not, you and I have talked about this before, is there was a tremendous focus on training. So during the time I was in that rotational year, a little over a year, I attended the management training programs for district managers, even though I wasn't a manager. So I was learning the interviewing skills process. I was learning the performance management process. You know, I was learning the project management process that was being taught to district managers. So that when I was appointed a district manager, I at least had the basic skills of what was expected as to how you're supposed to manage at Merck. Here's the performance review process. Here's the quarterly review process. Here's the, you know, and that really helped me out a lot in terms of engaging as a manager. I would give you two examples of early struggles. One of them was hiring someone um, who wasn't the right person for the job. And it was the first person I ever hired. And I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile it. You know, I used to put my calendar together for the month on how much time I would spend in the field. And I would send it out to all of my reps so they know where I was every day. 
And over the first few months, I was spending more and more time with this particular person. And, you know, it was the age-old self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, I hired him, I'm going to make him good. <laughs> and I'm going to make him good by spending more time with him. And so I was out working with one of my executive professional representatives, 25-year veteran in the field, extremely skilled at the highest level of a sales rep, who sat me down at lunch one day and said, you know, a few of us have been talking. Like, you know, you're not spending enough time with us because you're spending all that time with this guy. And, you know, he's probably not going to make it. <laughs> and you're really missing an opportunity to go to your strengths, which is most of the rest of the district, rather than focusing on your weakness, which is this guy. And you got to help us with that because you're good when you're out with us. You know, we learn things, you know, you know, it's great, but you're spending less time with us. Like, why are you doing that? Hmm. And I thought there was a very interesting, you know, idea of how I should be thinking about how I spend my time and how willing am I to step up to a mistake I made in hiring. And I went in to talk to my region manager after that. And I said, listen, I don't think this guy's going to work out. He said, oh, I knew that a couple months ago. <laughs> he said, I was waiting for you to get there, and I'm glad you got there. And I thought to myself, you know, first of all, I thought, well, why didn't you say something to me? But, you know, in retrospect, I realized, you know, the job of the region manager is to make sure the district managers learn their job well. And one of the things you got to learn is, do I have the right people on the bus? And how do I get them aligned with each other? But, you know, I would say that was one. And the other thing was, um, I mentioned earlier, I was a very task-oriented guy. And there was a particular guy in the district who um, had never been, he was a 20 year plus guy. He was not an executive rep. He was still a regular rep after 20 years, which is unusual. He never had a performance rating above good, but he never had fair or poor. I looked back a few, just good, good, good. And I would go out and work with him and he was very perfunctory, just doing the job in his territory on the Northwest side of Chicago calling on people, rotely going through the presentations. And I started pushing him. I just said, you know, like, you got to do more. You need to, like, we need to get better at presentation skills. You need to cover more doctors per week. We need to, and I was pushing, pushing. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't trying to push him out. I really was just thinking I could push his performance up through, you know, riding him a little bit. It was probably not as much coaching as it should have been at the time. And I ended up getting assigned to go to um, a, an assessment center for a week uh, as an assessor. Um, it was in, outside of St. Louis in Earth City. We called it Dirt City. <laughs> and it was one of the most intense weeks I had ever had as a district manager. We were on from Sunday morning until Friday night doing assessments, meeting afterwards with the management team that was there for the district managers, talking about every single person, what we assessed, the differentiating between intent and behavior. Don't tell me what you thought he was going to do. What did he do? Like, let's talk about the... And it was just a week where I was exhausted, and I got home that Saturday afternoon from Dirt City. We were living in, outside of Chicago. And my phone rang, and it was this rep who called to tell me he was resigning on a Saturday afternoon. He just called and said, I'm resigning from the company. And I said, geez, you've been with the company for 20, 25 years. Why are you resigning on Saturday afternoon? He said, I just want you to know I'm resigning. And he said, so now you know. And so I hung up the phone. I, was, I called my region manager and he said, we can't let him resign from the company. And I said, well, I said that to him, but he's not. he said to me, do you know where he lives? And I said, yeah. He said, come pick me up at my house and let's go to his house. And we went to his house and parked the car and walked up the back steps. And he was sitting in the middle of his living room. There was nothing in there but a lounge chair with pictures of his daughters and his wife all around. And he had a gun sitting on the table next to him. And he was gonna commit suicide. Wow. And, and Ed and I talked him into the car. We took him over to the Loyola University Psychiatric Center, which we happened to cover, right? So I knew exactly where it was and he was admitted. And he was in the hospital for a month or two for therapy and treatment. And um, when he came out, um, he called me and said, 
he was prepared to retire, not resign, retire. And so I said, let's get together for a cup of coffee and just talk about all this. Your territory's open, you just got out, you could retire next month if you work for him. He said, just meet me for a cup of coffee. So I met him for a cup of coffee and I'll never forget it. I said, I made this offer to him like, why don't you just come back for a month or two and see how you feel about it, you know? And he said, no, he said, oh, I'm gonna retire and you know, I don't ever wanna have to work for a person like you again. That's what he said to me. And back to my point of several minutes ago, which is just, I learned something about myself. I learned something about how to better deal with people and to try to understand circumstances better. And as I had learned the circumstances of his life in that relatively short period of time before he called me, was I, I realized like his whole world had collapsed. And I never knew any of that because when I was working with him, I wouldn't ask him questions about that stuff. You know, I'd ask him questions about product information and you know, All routings yeah. and territories and how many calls can we make today by six o'clock. And, yeah. and when he retired, and, I went in to talk to my region manager, Ed Fitzpatrick, about it. Ed said to me, did you learn something there? And I said, oh my God, yeah. And he said, so rem he said, remember that. Like, that's, you know, a life lesson. And we were fortunate that we did what we did that Saturday night. Yeah, absolutely. The thing that comes to mind here is, it, it's kind of surprising given the givens that that would be, you know, what this gentleman would have to, to say to you. Uh, in terms of what you learned, what advice would you give a manager in, or anybody that's in a leadership position. There are things that go on in people's personal lives that, you know what? I mean, you know, to me, the first thing I think about is like an HR deal here or something. Mm -hmm. But what advice would you give on the basis of that? And I'm sure many other experiences. Um, boy, we got to hit the number, right? That's why we're here. It's, it's about success. But there's also this investment, you know, that we make in people, okay, to build the T word, right? Because it's all about trust. What would you have done differently? What advice would you have for, for somebody that was leading? And if they're leading a group of 12 people, there's, there's you know, statistically, there's, there's probably somebody that's going through something, yeah. you know, that's, that's uh, highly personal in nature, that rocks their world that absolutely impacts their performance on the job. Yeah. Not that there's an answer in the back of the book, but what advice would we have for those people? You know, the, the three words are pay closer attention, yeah. not just to the work, but to the person. Mm -hmm. I think you said it a moment ago, hey, we've got a goal we have and we need to achieve that goal and here are the things we need to do to get there. But pay attention to the fact if someone's distracted or they, they, they're not really intent on getting to that goal and you don't know why. Mm -hmm. And I think in retrospect, I would say I thought it was easier to not pay attention to the personal side of things. Mm -hmm. I think it was easier to just stay focused on the task at hand and say, listen, I pay you X and your, that X is, means you're supposed to deliver this result and I'm here to help you do it. So let's figure out how we're gonna get that result as opposed to, is, is there something impeding this that has nothing to do with your skill level, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden it's about, yes, there's something else going on, in which case you then have, pay closer attention, get more of a balance in understanding something about the person and the people. Yeah. Recognizing that you both know that you're there to get the task done. Yeah. If there's a question about that, then I, as a manager, have not made things clear. That's not a, a, a sales rep's responsibility if, they're not, if it's not clear. That's the manager's responsibility. So yeah. Do you understand what we're trying to do here? Yeah. You know? And when the answer is yes, then the smart manager will say, great, tell me what it is. I need to hear it in your words, not my words. You repeat it in your words so I know you've got it great. Yeah. But then if something's not working to help get, you know, to get that person there, then you might want to consider what else is there. And at the time, I didn't think that was very important. I learned it was really important, but. Comparatively, right, it's such a mess. Like if you're there to manage, right? And there's a number of doctors and a number of presentations and competitive products and what are you saying here and what are you saying there? And I'm here to give you feedback on how well you do mm -hmm. this orchestrated thing that you've been trained to do. Boy, is that different than sort of 
diving off over into Lord knows where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the courage that's associated with leadership. And it's, it's kind of where managers turn into leaders mm -hmm. or at least have the opportunity to, you know, to do that. But that, I think, paints a, paints a very distinct picture of kind of these two things. Yeah. If you know where you're going, right, yeah. Yeah. that's management. You know, if you have no idea, <laughs> that's more <laughs> leadership, right? That's more like, okay, so what is the, yeah. but having those discussions and that, that kind of uh, exchange yeah. that builds a light. Let's talk about trust and accountability. What advice would you have for people in positions of leadership coming off of this story? How do you build trust? Is there something you do to build it? <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. how do you develop that with, with people? How long does it take? You know, that, any, any sort of advice that you might have on the T word? Yeah. You know, I, I kind of subscribe to Warren Bennis's theory that, you know, people can smell a phony a mile away. And I think that you have to get people to, to see you and to know you as a person so they recognize that you're no different from them. You may have a different position than they have, but you're a human being and that person's a human being. And, you know, we need to be able to connect at, at that level. And, and so, you know, and there, I think, are different ways to do that. Um, you know, and we talk about empathy and we talk about uh, emotional intelligence. And, but at a fundamental level, you've got to be able to create a relationship with a person. And if people work for you, then you've got to have a relationship with them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be personal. It needs to be at a level they would like it to be at, such that you believe that they will do what you ask them to do. That they, even if it's a little off the path, they trust you that you're giving them something that needs to be done that, you know, mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily in their wheelhouse or they didn't think it was. And I think that's part of leadership development is, is what is your personal style that allows you to connect with people and to engage with people that weakens the position power argument. Like I'm your boss, you're the subordinate, I tell you what to do. You know, how do you create this kind of a relationship with a person, right? And still get this work done. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, that, that is a challenge. I, you know, when you say what advice, I, you know, the advice is self-assess as to how you're connecting with people and if you're doing it more from a parent-child point of view as opposed to a, I'm your boss but I'm here to work with you to help us get stuff done because we got to get it done because if you don't get it done I have a problem mm -hmm. right as opposed to you have a problem because my boss expects me to get that done through <laughs> through you right so so there's an element of that that I think is really important and I, you know, just to reflect back on the other story for just a minute where I said to you it was easier to not pay attention to the personal stuff. Some of that was training, and I'll throw you back to the Ferd Fournier days, where oh, yeah. Ferd's training was very much, this is all about task and get it done, right? And so, yeah. and in retrospect, that was very, very good from a management perspective. It wasn't necessarily good from a leadership perspective. Mm -hmm. In trying to piece you know, a lot of this, this stuff together here, right? like, like people say, to effectively lead, you have to have trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you don't have trust, how do you get it? Well, you effectively lead. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's sort of like, if there isn't something where you get to see me in action, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think a big part of what you're saying is it's, you gotta be genuine, right? Mm -hmm. Here's who I am, right? I'm up for feedback. Yeah. And I hope you are, because <laughs> you know yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you some. But but there's this whole genuine mm -hmm. piece to it. But we're we're doing something together, mm -hmm. right? And whatever this is, that is the basis of how we're going to form trust. Mm -hmm. You know, we value this, and we're going to get it done. I I get back to but with you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, regardless of what I would have thought or who I would have chosen, mm -hmm. uh, we got to play Delaware. Yeah. And you're going to be on the side of me. And if yeah. we have any success there yeah. or any hope of success, yeah. we're, we we're going to need to be on the same page to figure this out. Yeah. So where does the, the, the whole idea of accountability come into this sort of discussion, right? So there's the part where you got to pay more attention to the personal side of things. And that really 
provides you with a significant number of dividends when it comes to people telling you the truth mm -hmm. about where they are, what's going on. You're acting genuine, so that endears them to. Um, how about accountability? And how about the people, uh, or have you ever uh, experienced this, people that are so interested in developing trust that they don't hold people accountable? Mm -hmm. So it's that sort of dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, as I say the term accountability. I have seen many times managers don't hold their people accountable because they want to make the decisions. And so somebody who works for them almost gets absolved of their accountability. They get indemnified because they have to ask their manager everything. Right? And we would say, well, is that a good management style? Is that a bad management style? It is a style and people employ it. And it tends to, and the organization, an organization, I think in a large organization, people would love to push accountability up. So I'm not accountable. My manager is the accountable person. He told me I should do this or I shouldn't do that, as opposed to I took the accountability myself for deciding I should do this and I'm not going to do that. And then check in with my manager to make sure he knows that's what I'm doing. And th that's a fine line, mm -hmm. but it's a really important one. And I guess it is easier to move away from accountability uh, as a manager to, you know, try to create a tighter personal relationship and trust. But I, you know, I don't think you're doing your job right if, if you know, I think you have to have a balance. And I think. You know, you, we had lines of accountability. We have delegations of authority. Delegation of authority was how, what decisions were you allowed to make? Biggest one was always about money. How much money am I allowed to approve before I have to go up and ask another level mm -hmm. for, you know, a level of approval? And there was a delegation of authority issue, which, you know, when I took over as CEO of AstraZeneca, and I worked for the CEO for almost six years on his management team, I was, I got into that office and in the first few weeks I was in the job, I was absolutely surprised, and I can honestly say this, I was really surprised at how much the rest of the management team that I was on asked me for advice as the new CEO because they used to ask the old CEO and he would give them advice. He would tell them what to do. He liked that role. And I was exactly the opposite. I was like, what are we paying you all this money for? <laughs> what are you asking me for an operations decision? I'm not an operations guy. You're the operations guy. Yeah. Like, you make that decision. And one of the first things I did, absolutely true story, was I wrote a note to our chairman and said I would like to change the delegations of authority the board had given to the CEO. Because the delegation of authority was relatively small. It was in the $5 million range on a multi-billion dollar budget. So above five million, I have to go to the audit committee to get approvals for stuff. And I said, I need a grant of authority of like $50 million. I mean, I can't be asking the audit committee to review stuff at seven, eight million, this is crazy. And my chairman agreed with me and it went to the finance committee for discussion, the audit committee at the next board meeting. And they said that they were willing to increase my delegation of authority. And then one of the board members said, but you're not going to increase the delegation of authority to the rest of your people, are you? And I <laughs> said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> like, I'm trying to push accountability down into the organization. And one of the markers for that, one of the things that people follow is the grant of authority. What am I allowed to do? You know, there were other things about hiring and all, but everybody followed the money. It was like, well, how much am I allowed? So I was like, take me from five to 50, I'm gonna move my direct reports from 500,000 to 10 million, you know, so that they are then accountable and they're not gonna come and ask me, can I spend this $5 million? No, that's, you're accountable for that, right? Yeah. And I believe there are markers in an organization around accountability that people follow. And it's not necessarily written in the rule book. It is, cultural, it is, you know, it's symbolic. I think symbolism on this is really important. Yeah. Who am I holding accountable? You know, do a town hall with your head of operations and tell everybody he's in charge. Yeah. You guys think I'm in charge? Let me tell you something. He's running operations. This is he's the your guy. This is like, this. he's my guy. 
and he's your guy. <laughs> he's the guy. You know, he, he, he's, he's, he, she is the, yeah, that's yeah, the person. That's yeah. the accountable person. And, and again, that's a delegation, right? You do that publicly and everybody goes, that's hey, a symbolism. This? That's symbolism in this company. Like, that means the CEO, who we think is at like this level, thinks our boss, who we think is at this level, is really like this way with him. And maybe I need to get a little bit more aligned with that guy, yeah. you know, as opposed to impress the CEO that I'm a good operations person. Let me end this pretty much the same way I started it by saying, I, we, anybody that'll look at this, you know, honored, you know, that you're here. But I'm also honored to call you a friend, sir. Well, thanks. Thank you. You are my friend. So much That's on behalf of everyone yeah. for spending the time and providing the insight. Good. Well, thanks. This is great. It's a little bit of a walk down memory lane and uh, a good one at that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely.